This is the Celtic Exchange Weekly. This is Paddy and I'm joined here by Miff and Joe as we cover all things Celtic. Celtic head into the international break after clocking up yet another three points by beating Hibs 3-1 at Celtic Park. It's our 18th win in 19 games and we've, since we've played since the World Cup break and that form has put the boys in an incredible position to finish the season with something, something special. Miff, a difficult game on Saturday versus Hibs for a number of reasons. But again, Celtic done what they needed and it was a de- deserved win in the end. What's your general thoughts from the game and what's been your Celtic moment of the week? Hi Paddy, hi Joe, hello listeners, viewers. Um, a very frustrating game, I found. I-, I thought it was really, you know, just the circumstances of the game I felt in many ways worked against us. Hibs are traditionally a sticky opponent when they come to Celtic Park. You, you know, recent history, they've, they've produced some, some decent performances. But I thought the sending off actually worked against us because it just I don't think the game would have evolved the way the way it did. Uh, Hibs really started to defend very deep and, and compact, and they had ten players between the posts. It was very difficult for Celtic to create anything um, after the sending off. But uh, just delighted that we got the three points, and this Celtic team just find a way. They've got a they've got a real knack of finding a way when they really really have to, and, and they did it again. You know, it got fairly deep into the game when it was still one-one, and again, just that, just a show of strength and the versatility they were having, the the um, the depth that we have on the bench, impact being made by two two of the subs that, that Ange made. So, just shows how important the squad is as well. And is that now nine games remaining? Am I right in saying nine? Yes, nine, nine games remaining and six wins required. Um, so. You, you know, we're just we're just kind of ticking it down, and that that's the way it gets at this point in the season. Um, moment of the week, uh, I'll go for the Celtic Park or Parkers return of Mikel Lustig. Is that is that a hot topic? Oh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that. I'd say, I'd say it, but Parkers. I don't think everyone uh, says it. No, well, I did, no say, I did say both. I, I did I say did Celtic say Park slash Parkers return of Mikel Lustig. Yep. What a noise that was! Considering <laughs> we were one 0 down at half time as well, he got, he, got a, he got a brilliant reception on his return and. Uh, you know, a fairly recent hero, uh, probably someone, you know, just for purposes of keep, keep him in the squad, someone maybe could have kept a hold off for the important season that was coming up. But listen, that's old news. Um, we've all seen John Joe Kenny we move on. So, um, <laughs> great return for Lushday, great reception that he got and uh, great to see that that warmth for the fans is, is really still there for him. Yeah, I'd agree with you there. I think someone like uh, Mika Lushday will, will never forget. Um, for I must say, Kulio is still my favourite. Half time, ah, yeah, yeah, half time appearance. Kilio is still ah, my yeah. favourite. Ah, yeah. ah, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. No, fair enough. I, I think um, it'll be, you know, long in the memory when actually we kind of let him go. And yeah, I think most Celtic fans would agree his time was spent. But I all thought that he deserved to be part of that hopefully potential final year of of going on to possibly win ten in a row. I think we were all a little bit surprised to see Mika move on. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely someone I'll. I'll I'll hold in high regard for everything he, he, he brought and one of those players as we've spoke about in this show before he, he just got it didn't he Aye. I'll never forget that goal yep. at Ibrox what a game that was and just for him I remember um, I remember him breaking through and he bounces off uh, Tavernier I think and then the next one up is Clint Hill and just said Clint you should be back here with your slippers went past him and just put it in the bottom right corner I remember when he got through just shouting please be him Please be him. There's one player you want. It's them. Let like him to score against is them, and it was just ah, oh, it was magic. Anyway, I think as well that those feelings were echoed from Rangers fans as well. I think that that really put the, <laughs> the cherry on <laughs> top when they saw it was him that had scored the loud. No him. To be funny, you say that. I heard forty thousand of them shout, "Please don't be him." So. <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, there's a lot many left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at, at that point. Actually, that's a good point, Joe. <laughs> we'll go forty. Um, but no, um, a, a hero, a hero of Celtic, a cult hero, um, and yeah, wish him all the best. It's good to see him back. Joel, welcome back to the show. Um, we've so now, much. no, good, good to have you, mate. Good to have you. Uh, we've now got a break before the Ross County game on the second of April, um, but we're in great position going into the business end of the season. How do you feel about it all, and, and what's been your moment of the week? Uh, I'm, f- I'm feeling optimistic about it all. Still, I mean, there's no reason. Not to be, we've only lost one game domestically since September. Um, yeah, feeling good. Uh, by all accounts, I didn't, I wasn't at the game Saturday, but by all accounts, I've heard it was a very tough watch for a lot of it. It wasn't maybe the most fluent of performances, but 
like all great teams do, won the one at all costs, the one in whatever way possible. So it was, uh, and we used the full squad, as you said, Math. So uh, yeah, feeling good about things now. I think international breaks come at a good time, given injuries, etc. Um, but yeah, it was given Hibs have actually been in a fairly decent run of form as well. It's always it doesn't matter who you're up against, need you win at all costs. Um, but my moment of the week. Um, it was actually, I picked up on it more in the unique angle uh, that Celtic always released the next day, but I noticed after the first goal, Jota's reaction at the first goal straight away, get the fans going and Kyogo gets the ball, doesn't even ball celebrating Kyogo, get the ball, put it in the spot, like, meaning business, we're ready to take the game and that's what they've done. Yeah, I, I think... Um... I'm a big fan of the unique angle. I think you, you, you definitely get that little insight. You capture everything, I always find. You yeah, capture everything. Yeah, and it's a lot better than it just pan into different scenes when you're watching it on TV. Don't get me wrong, we, we do get some great footage, obviously, but that is just, you're, you're there live on the park. It's uh, It's been great. I, I like the just the, the kind of subtle interactions between the players. Yeah. You know, yeah. You'll, you'll maybe see who's celebrating directly on the camera, but then because because of the unique angle you maybe see a bit more of the pitch and you see other players sort Aye. of just speaking to each other or giving instructions or you know geeing each other up I just I just think it does it gives you a wee bit more than what you actually see it on on the day sometimes it picks up in the audio as well I'd love to hear <laughs> everything that you were you, you possibly could hear but you always love hearing a uh, I, um, Johnson talk away like, well I say talk away goes for it man it's great just to hear I'd him. love to hear the unedited footage ah, yeah, yeah. Imagine, you, imagine, imagine you get the full the full game unedited uh, the unique angle stuff so ah, that's my first swear word in this show I don't know if you know, <laughs> going to allow it he's away one week Dave's got a bleep machine I'll Dave's got a bleep machine I'll, I'll need to, I'll need to know when fine. this happened so three minutes in <laughs> no definitely a great moment um, and, and just shows you just how focused they are Um I don't think they're a team that knows when when they're under pressure or when they're beaten, and I think that they wear it very, very well. That's something I've kind of picked up on. Like I think many fans will have picked up, up on, of course, as well. But they 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 just don't know when to say that's it. Yeah, they just want to keep going, and obviously, as the chat goes, they we never stop. So Definitely. absolutely brilliant. So let's take a look at what's coming up in this week's show. We'll get started with this week's uh, big debate, and it's a topical one as we look at the impact on players not being selected for the national teams this time around. Then it's time for this week's mystery Celt as I go head to head with the lads, um, as this week they tried to name the famous ex Celt as well. And after that, we're going to cover the listener's question, which this week comes from Jamie in Perth in Australia, and he wants to discuss the and succession plan. I don't know if I want to discuss that, but thanks for the question, Jamie. <laughs> and finally, we'll finish this week's show by bringing you something which we think you'll enjoy from this week in Celtics media. Okay. So, we'll look at the big debate then today, guys. So, basically, a lot of headlines from the last week centre around the fact that Rio Hitate and Kyogo had once again been overlooked by the Japan national team, despite the brilliant form here in Scotland. From a purely Celtic point of view, a lot of fans are happy that this minimises the chance of them getting injured for the running. But how will then the players themselves be feeling? And on that note, the question for today is, what are the ramifications of some of their, their top players being overlooked for international duty? Will it make them consider their own futures at Celtic Park if they can't fulfil their international ambitions? And um, will it make other potential signings think about twice about coming here? Um, Miff, I'll go to yourself for the initial response to that question. I think it's a worry. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I think it's a worry. Uh, the reason I think it's a worry is because the selling point of coming here is undoubtedly we will be a high profile stepping stone, either to a move to our neighbours in England or a higher profile club at a you know, in, in a bigger league. I take the point that, yeah, it's great, they don't get selected and they're fit for the running, but I don't think that's why players join Celtic. I think they join Celtic for the profile of playing for a big club, which will then lead to either a bigger move or international honours. I would say that um, we lost Juranovic on that basis, I think. Yeah, that that was that was one of the key, well, it was certainly one of the key reasons that he gave and, and albeit when you see the, the results at Union Berlin are enjoying, I think it be Frankfurt oh, uh, yeah. the weekend as well there. So, you know, they're, they're fine. They're, they're well placed in... Europa League winners, of course. The, the Bundesliga. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Uh, yes, Joe, well done. <laughs> um, so, I, I, I don't... It doesn't sit well with me when we're, we're happy that, that our players aren't being selected, albeit 
that in the context of the Japanese players, I think the Japan manager is talking absolute mince because he selected one player that's playing with Celtic and not selected two others. I think he maybe just for whatever reason doesn't fancy the players. Now, I, I would I would take a major issue with that because they're two of the finest players that Celtic have had in recent history, in my opinion. But I think this comes down to the manager rather than it being a wider issue. I think the Japanese manager, for whatever reason, doesn't fancy Kyogo in that position and Hitati in the other. Because how can you say that, that it's down to the quality of the league while selecting another player in the squad? To me, that just makes absolutely no sense. But to go back to the answer to the original question, it's a bad thing when our players aren't being selected for international duty because it, it does, in my opinion potentially give a negative view of moving to this league and has ramifications for us in the future if we're trying to sign somebody where they're trying to increase our profile. I, I, I know where you're coming from in terms of the, the Japan manager. Um, I think one of the things that's kind of stood out for me though was he was very quick to say that he did want to kind of try and keep the World Cup team together as a bit of a reward for what they've done and but he also said that he wanted to try some new things out as well. Um, I think he's also quoted in saying he knows what Kyogo and Rio are, are all about, um, but he, he's saying that there's a bit of a long time to the next World Cup, so this is a, a perfect time to try new things. Now, yes, granted, for me, this is the time you try these guys, absolutely, yep. um, because it's time to see what they're all about, what, what you're going to get from them. I also think he's possibly thinking, well, I know how good they are, but let's have a look at other players and possibly bring them in as well. Um, one that will definitely be answered down the line, of course. I don't... I, I, I'd put a lot of money on, basically, the two the two of them. Maybe, well, definitely Hitati playing at the next World Cup. I, I think so. I just think he's he's only going to get stronger and stronger. Um, and I would be very surprised if Kyogo wasn't there as well. I really would. Um, Joe, what, what about yourself? What do you think on this matter? What's... What's your main thing on it? I mean, there's a combination of things. Like when they first signed Rio Hatate and Kyogo and Dyson Maeda, that you almost, I mean, you almost sort of took it for granted that they would be, you would like to have thought that they were going to be an automatic place in that team. But, I mean, you look over the last year or so, I mean, you've got the guy, is it Matoma from Brighton? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that guy is just, it feels like he's just sort of came from nowhere and is emerged to be Brighton's best player team that are really doing well in England that itself is going to boost your profile and you've got other guys who are, are performing they've got a really really good squad now yeah. and it's not I mean it's not as if they've been performing badly and, and he's not the manager's not really got a choice but to look elsewhere like, I mean that's a team that got to the quarterfinals of the World Cup mm -hmm. and lost in penalties so really uh, it's a hard one because I would love to see Hatate and Kyogo go into that team and it's hard to argue against the manager on that basis, but it doesn't look as if because I don't I don't want this to be the case going forward, as you say, Math, because I, I want the profile of the league to be a selling point for these guys to come over. Um but ah uh, it, it's a shame and I would love to keep I mean, especially Hatati given they get injured at the weekend. Um it might not even have been fit anyway. Yeah. Um but I don't know. I'm not I'm not particularly happy that they're being overlooked given that, I mean, I had a look at the squad earlier on and I think there's a guy that plays for Lask in Austria that's in the squad. He's an attacking midfielder. And then I looked, um, maybe they're playing in Europa League or Conference League and playing European football after Christmas and they're not. So that's not even a basis to like call up these guys ahead of our own guys. Um, and they're calling up players that still play in Japan. Yeah. So... I don't know. It's a funny one. Um, and Kyogo's twenty eight. So realistically, his last this next World Cup that's coming up in four years time, three years time is going to be his last. Realistically, as a international player. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel for them. Um, I hope it's something that's not going to be overlooked long term. Um, and I know Maida's been in the squad, but um, I hope it's not something that's going to be overlooked long term because it would be a real hit to Celtic if it does. Yeah. I I don't think I've really thought about it in the terms of how, how it affects us, more so on the basis that we've kind of had this problem for years, right? I, I remember um, people were crying out for Fraser Forster to get called up to the England team, but he was just getting shunned because of the league he was playing in. We lost Gary Hooper because of that. Mm. I even go as far back as I remember Alan Thompson was playing some incredible football, had a brilliant run in the, the UEFA Cup. 
uh, and then performed in the Champions League, performed uh, in, in the later stages of the UEFA Cup again. And it's just that Chris Sutton, Chris Sutton fell out with England manager before he signed it. Well, yeah, probably, <laughs> just that go sounds, for those players. Sounds like Sutton, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but Alan Thompson only ends up with one cap. Do you know what I mean? Yep. It, it, it's this league's always going to be looked down upon. We could we could still be competing financially with any any team in the world. It, it's just this the small nature of our league. It's just not going to be up at that level. The caliber of player is not going to be up at that level. But what Celtic are, they're an attractive brand for players that want to go and play in the top five leagues. We can't forget that. Um, I don't, for me, the, the thing that makes me feel okay about it is, is that I don't think the international side of things is the be all and end all for players that are going to be, possibly only be around from 18 months to two years. I don't think it's going to be the biggest issue that we face. Part of me also thinks, and you might disagree with me here, um, I was saying this to, to yourself before coming on here, Joe, um, I seen Steve Clark's uh, press conference about Greg Taylor um, basically being omitted from the squad, and he said, "Oh, you need to speak to Celtic on that one." Uh, and it's about the the bill of health that was given by our medical team. Um, now this is last Friday, and then obviously you see Greg Taylor start on the Saturday. Um, so of course, Scottish media are all over this. They've pressed Ange about it after the game, and his response was was. I don't know, it, it got me thinking a little bit. He said that our medical teams are in contact with every international country that comes in and looks to, to see about their player, bringing their player into the fold. And we will give them an up-to-date version of how they are, how they're feeling. And part of me thinks that the medical team just want to treble that much, that they're just fudging the stats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not as, obviously not as blatant as that, but I just think that as a team, we are so, so far advanced in that that we're basically saying... This is where this player's at at the moment. Um, this is what we need them for. If they want to play international football, we'll not step in their way, but we don't feel that you're, you're going to get 90 minutes out of them, for example. And essentially, this is what they're saying to Scotland, is this is the risk you're taking by essentially promising this guy X amount of playing time, yeah. that this is either pick him or pick somebody else that you're going to get some a lot more out of, yeah. guaranteed. So. Cause because he said the same about Cameron Carter Vickers as well. He said that the US medical team were in contact with Celtic. Like, how's he looking? How's things? And all, all of a sudden, he's not picked. Quite funny on that as well. I seen that um, on social media when they announced their squad. It wasn't just Celtic fans bombarding their page about where Carter Vickers like was. It was it was a lot of American football fans like, why is this guy not here? Mm -hmm. Like he he's the future. Not, none of them could really believe that. Um, so I don't know. I think it's a. I think it's a very difficult one. I think that the, for me, obviously, you think other players and agents may become aware of situations such as this and obviously reconsider coming to Scotland to, to try and bring their players over here. I don't think that will be much of an issue personally, but what about yourself on that, myth? Well, I think first and foremost, they'll, they'll generally come, if somebody's already been playing international football, they'll come to Scotland, you know, potentially Celtic or, or whoever else for more regular football. If they've been playing elsewhere or not playing elsewhere, as the case may be, they become the Celtic for regular football, so that they're putting themselves back in the in the viewing of the the, the international manager. I think it's fair to say, vast majority of professional footballers will want to represent their country. It's just you know something they they'll seek to do as, as part of their career. And to me, it's just a negative if if they don't get to do that or if I move to, to Scotland or Celtic is perceived as being something that's going to restrict that. I, I just think that's an, a negative. But again, I go back to my point on specifically around the, the Japanese players eh, that I find it odd that you pick one and then don't pick two, citing that the league that they're in is, is an issue. Well, th that's contradictory immediately. So I, I just get the feeling... Japanese managers using the, the old excuse of the Scottish League yeah, in this yeah. instance rather than it being a, a genuine point with Carter Vickers and Taylor that's slightly different because there seems to be a wee bit of, I agree with you there Paddy there's a bit I think Celtic are, are kind of leaning on, on this to say you know, the guys have played a lot of football and if I, you know if, if it's not as, as actual qualifiers or as friendly as it's, it's, it's qualifiers qualifiers, right. qualifiers. Well, Scotland's definitely Scotland's Euro qualifiers I'm yeah, not sure qualifier. about America but so, you know, they're probably just leaning on that fact. Plus, 
Would, would Taylor have started? Probably not. Probably not. No. Nah. Has Carter Vickers been starting uh, intermittently? He, got, he starts some, doesn't he? He doesn't start them all, but he starts He started some. one at the World Cup. Uh, he, did, sure. he, did, he started it, one. It one wasn't game. a dead rubber as well. It was an important game. Uh, yeah. I, so They definitely see a future in him. Uh, so I think I think they're maybe just leaning on that fact that well, if you're not going to play them, we're not going to release them type of thing. So, um, Which is fair. Uh, again, I think it sets up Celtic need to look after themselves they need to look after their players that's a fact but I think it sets a fairly dangerous precedent if you're if you're playing about with that because the potential is you actually annoy the player as much as the international team if they feel yeah. like they want to go that that for me is the bit that you just need to manage very very carefully but I think when it comes down to that we've got the right man for the job I think also that I mean you're even saying about the Scottish League tag that's been thrown about but Kyogo, Hatate, and Maida have all proved themselves in Japan and been one of the better players in that league. So it's not as if it, like they've underperformed elsewhere. I mean, Maida won the league in Japan. Hatate won the league in Japan. And I've, I mean, I follow, I don't know if any of you follow Dan Olowitz Aye. on Twitter. So I've seen a lot about that. I think it was Frontali he played for, Hatate. And he said that is one of the best teams that have ever played in that Japanese league. Just like the homegrown talent, the just the way that they played it was just absolutely brilliant. And Hatate was a massive part of that. So it's not as if he's not went under the radar in Japan. Um, and Kyogo, obviously, everything about him just speaks for itself. Like he played for Vsel Kobe and a high-profile team with Iniesta, David Villa. Like, it's not as if these guys are going unnoticed. They're, they've done well elsewhere. It's just, it's a bit of a strange one, I find. It's almost this playing down the league again though, isn't it? In this, yeah. like Even the Japanese league. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of you, Murray. Uh, the the journalist, I think he just says stuff just to rile people up for the sake of it. It's golf come to us, aye, 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 but he'll comment on football. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was talking about how there was like no represent, well, hardly any representation um, from Scotland and the Scotland team, and you're like, that's a good thing. <laughs> that is a good thing. Uh, some of our, our better players are now playing in, in a higher standard of league. Yeah, all right, it brings down the standard of the league that we're involved in. But when the majority of your Scotland team is made up of players playing a- across the continent, mm. surely that's only a good thing. And not only that, it's the fact that, I, I think he's missing the point of that they're not playing in Scotland, it's the fact that they originally did and they're too good for the league. Spot They've on. actually kicked on. Yeah. But I, again, we, we, we can moan, I, I can remember, maybe going back about 10 years when there was only a, a few players playing in England, we, we can moaned about that that there wasn't enough players going abroad or, or, or going on to other leagues. Now we do have that. It's then seen as... I, I don't agree that that's a negative. I actually think that's a positive. Yeah. I do agree that's a positive that, you know, Scottish players are now, are now pushing themselves and going right outside their comfort zone, experiencing other cultures, other leagues, which generally will make them tactically more versatile as well. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, there's a number of players who will have international ambitions with our team as well. Um, they currently find themselves out the picture with ourselves at Celtic. So obviously, guys... Like um, obviously like David Turnbull and, and and Kobayashi that are just coming into it, they'll have ambitions for players that are just kind of hovering around and um, you know maybe have a chance of getting into an international team. So I'm I'm more so looking at Turnbull here. Will this maybe see players kind of want to move on in that sense? Like they think I've got a chance of getting in this Scotland team. I'm I'm not doing much here at Celtic. I think in, in the context of Turnbull, I, I think it will just be, he'll just want to play more regularly. I think he, he needs to be playing more often. Um, like I've said before, and, and rate some Arium, but it's down to him and whether he feels he's going to play enough. Um, good to see that he was he was the first choice to come off the bench when Hattati got injured, albeit that I think Moy wasn't available. I didn't, Moy wasn't, I didn't yeah. see the subs. I had a back injury, I think. Even though it was at the game, I didn't see who the subs were, bizarrely. Um, but, Turnbull, yeah, I think Turnbull's got Angie's trust, but I just don't know if he's going to play enough minutes that will keep him happy. Yeah, I think he wants to be somebody that's that's starting every week. Yeah, I, I think so too, and and especially someone trying to kick on for the injury he had as well. He he will want want to play, and he's he's not going to hang about at Celtic, and and nor would he even think about going on loan. He's he's coming into a, a really good part, a very strong part of his career. I think he'll want to be playing week in week out. Um, obviously many supporters are also firmly against international football anyway and like I say they're, they're, they're pleased when players don't get called up I'm not sure how I feel about this stance but from an injury point of view it does certainly keep them in better shape for Celtic's running what do you think about the mindset of some fans on that like do you think that's like do you think it's a good thing when we, we're able to keep players at, at Lennox Town I see pros and cons but 
I, I think players still want to play for their country. I mean, selfishly, I mean, I'm, I do like, I don't know, I do like international football in the sense I will, like, I would go to Scotland games and I'm I very much, I mean, I'm, I was born in 99, so I'd never seen Scotland at a major tournament until two years ago. <laughs> so, you're killing me here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, I'm, I'm of the generation of, I'm just used to seeing Scotland fail. So I, I just just when it actually started to turn slightly good again, it's right. it's a bit of a novelty for me. And the fact that there was a lot of Celtic players in that team and ninety uh, nine, <laughs> December ninety nine as well. Oh. He's all that this I know, I know. Um, oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Oh, is there more water? Jeez, right here. Um, yeah, so I mean, I can understand people's point of view that aren't in, in, in international football that this is a great thing that they're not getting called up and it's just it's a matter of fast forward two weeks until club football comes back. Um, but I, I can see I can see both points of view. I would love to see guys like David Turnbull get into the Scotland squad selfishly, but yeah. equally, I mean, I'm thinking ahead to the run-in. This is the most important point of the season. I want everyone back, like, everyone wrapped in cotton wool until that point. Yeah, so... And it's, just, it, it's not a selfish, well, it's selfish in the front of you want them there for Celtic, but technically all you want to do is see your team succeed. Um, I think, though, I've, I have been thinking about it a lot lately just in terms of international football. I'm, I'm just, I'm not a fan of it at all. I never have been. Um, I like watching the tournaments, but like, kind of like yourself, I only seen Scotland at the Euro 96 and then World Cup 98. I never really seen much before. And Ever since, I, sorry, we're, 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 I think Mavs gave up on this show tonight, guys. <laughs> if it makes you better, I was born in the 80s, is that there? That's all right. Oh, well, I can I can remember 86. Right. I uh, can vaguely remember David Neary scoring like, against Brazil, but it was only a very, very young boy. I can I can remember the remnants of that rather than the actual thing itself. Um, can remember 86, 90, and I, w- I was explaining that to my, my oldest son that, Scotland had qualified for like five, I think it was five World Cups in a row, maybe six. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so international football is, is probably different, viewed differently for me than, than it is for you guys. I, okay. I, you know, I, I, I do enjoy of watching Scotland. But I think it does feel different now. And what I mean by that is that the balance of power in, in terms of how club football is viewed now and the prestige in club football, I think has, has diluted the importance of uh, the internationals more so from fans maybe maybe to a degree from players mm-hmm. uh, but but more so from from fans what has helped though in, in recent recent years is that Scotland seem to be going through a wee upturn and, and I think that's as a result of the th- things we've just discussed you know players playing further afield and experiencing different things and it's bringing more strength to the squad and, and the numbers within the squad I, I just think I, I you know Celtic fans Celtic's their priority. Let's yep. let's be honest about it. You know, most club fans will feel the absolute same. Whilst you would like people in your squad to get international honours, I think it's a positive. Mm-hmm. However, I am patently aware that there will be loads of fans who just simply don't care and mm-hmm. all they care about is Celtic. And the most important thing is that player being ready to play for Celtic at the weekend and give it a hundred percent. I just think there's a wee bit more to it than that when it comes to international honours because it's a subjective thing it's how that that individual player feels about it and I think most players as I said just psychologically will want to represent their country so we need to be seen as a, as a breeding ground that can can give that to players when they come here yeah, clearly that's important I mean you look at Mikey Johnson I mean Mikey Johnson changed his allegiance like what was that two weeks ago three weeks ago so I mean don't want to go into the argument of who you would feel more attached to, like, as in like what country you'd want to play for, or if it's a case of what is my best chance of playing international football. But that is that is part of it. Clearly, he's wanting to raise his own profile. He's wanting to play. I mean, they always say it: playing the biggest stage, qualify for a major tournament. I mean, it's 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 a one-off, but it's a lot for a lot of careers. That is that for a lot of players. That is this pinnacle of their careers is playing in that stage. Uh, absolutely, but I think the key is how much did Tino pay you to mention Mickey uh, Johnson? Took the words right <laughs> out of my mouth. I was like, suddenly, this is clearly a plant, Joe. Suddenly uh, a guy is sitting with a beer and a pizza in Rome right now smiling. Uh, clearly the fact a plant, that he's got man. to hear about Mickey Johnson. <laughs> um, no, nah, he is a plant. Uh, that's it right there. 100%. I think so. I think with Johnson he's picked the right time to be honest yeah. because Ireland are in a bit of a changeover at the moment. Um, 
some great young players coming through at the at the moment with the, the national team, and I think uh, Johnson could be a real leader if he if he starts to to, to play for them. I think um, it might do his confidence a world of good as well. Um, I'll be interested to see how he does it the, the weekend because he's been called up, so be good to see how he gets on. But I enjoy that one, Tino. Well done. I know, I'm in Camp MJ as well. Yes, <laughs> nah, it, basically, it, it is an interesting debate, and obviously, one we'll have to keep a, a close eye on with uh, with the future international windows. Uh, not just with Kyogo and Hitati, as we've mentioned, there's a, a few others there that you will be thinking, how important is it to them? Um, as I say, I kind of see Celtic as, as that stepping stone club, sadly. Um, so, I think 18 months to two years, if they're in a wee bit of an exile, they're not getting called up at all. I don't think it'll be a huge worry to a lot of players, but it may mean a lot to some. Um, so yeah, definitely want to keep an eye on. Okay, guys, we'll move on to this week's mystery cell. This is a uh, this. Monjo. I, I hate Come being. I uh, don't don't don't. I, I I hate being this side. All right, I I do. I've got I've got a good one today. I I, I you, you won't get it. I'm going to be honest. You won't get it. He's taunting you, Joe. He's taunting you. I'm taunting, He's jumped I'm, I'm taunting the barrier. Um, but basically, mind games. we'll start with a quick reminder of last week's mystery self for anyone that's missed it. Um, so, uh, despite an impressive record, sorry, despite an impressive goals record throughout my career, I never won any international caps. I've scored for Celtic in the Champions League group stages, and Neil Lennon signed me twice. The answer, of course, was Gary Hooper, uh, an absolute hero of myths. Correct. Yeah. What, what and I, mine, I must say. I, I remember watching him in high school, math. That was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Brilliant. I think I was at college, you know. I'm feeling it, man. I'm feeling, I'm feeling it today, lads. It was a bad day at work, man. No, I've come into this. This is just... Jeez, oh. Well, Miff, let's talk about Gary Hooper. So he oh. signed, signed for Celtic in 2010 for two and a half... Well, just under two and a half million pounds. Scored on his debut against Braga in the Champions League qualifier. We're not going about the second leg. Um, scored big goals against Rangers in Europe and in cup finals for Celtic and moved on in June 2013 when he signed for Norwich for around £5 million. Your views on Hooper? Well, a striker uh, could have been a great, absolutely no doubt he would have scored hundreds of goals had he stayed at Celtic. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. And picked the wrong move, unfortunately for him, went from a team that was creating chances week in week out for him to a team where he was the lone striker in, in Norwich a struggling Norwich team at that point um, playing his own striker which as we know was not his strong suit he was much better playing off someone like Anthony Stokes when, when he was here they, they were a, a deadly combo yeah. so a lot of for Gary Hooper um, somebody who also he did struggle to stay fit for, for long periods which kind of hampered him as well but he was an electric striker scored goals at the very top level in the Champions League and you were right what you mentioned earlier, we, we lost him because of lack of international recognition, but as a result of his move, that kind of stalled his career because he, he just picked the wrong club. I think if he'd have hung on for another season, he'd have maybe get, went up another level in terms of the clubs that would have come in for him. But it's a short career, as Joe's already mentioned, and I think the, the chance of big money came, he took it. But for me, wrong team at the wrong time for Gary Hooper and, and what could have been for us Celtic fans who'd watched him yeah I think he would happily admit that as well to be honest Gary Hooper I, th I generally think he he's down to earth enough to say that you know he thought this was going to be the move that would get him his international caps and um, you know he, he wanted to play in the Premier League ev every season and I think he would happily say yep hands up I've just a further point on, on that um, we, we mentioned earlier about someone like Michael Ostick who came in and, and got it I think with Hooper, he saw it as a bit more of a stepping stone and, and whilst, you know, that team was, was a lot of fun to, to follow. Uh, as, as a Celtic fan, I think with Hooper, his eyes were always on moving back down south mm -hmm. uh, rather than, you know, kind of staying up here. If you think of other players at the time, such as Joe Ledley, who yeah. probably got a bit, a bit more integrated into things, I think Hooper was was more, had one eye on, on moving back down south. But, but listen, it was a, it was a beautiful relationship where it last lasted, and I, I am a huge huge Gary Hooper fan. I, it was definitely something I read in an interview about him lately, and he said that he was heart torn about, about leaving. Um, he said, "Don't tell he, me that, Paddy." No, I'm sorry, mate. I'm sorry. Bringing it all back. Again. He said that he, he brought you a patch on my. I've not gone into that. I've not gone. He's one of the main I reasons him. I left Celtic. I love him. 
Was this wee guy aye, hanging stop, about? Aye, stalking him, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Sounds about right to be fair. <laughs> Joe, what about yourself? What's your views on Hooper? I, I loved him. Were you old well. enough? I, I was, I was. I did, I did remember him. Um, I, I love Gary Hooper as well. Um, I think, I remember seeing a quote a few weeks ago, and I don't know if it was James Forrest, or it was one of the guys that have been here for a while, it was Callum McGregor, James Forrest, but one of them said, I know more people that have left Celtic and said that they regret leaving than guys that have said they've left and they've like not looked back like or along those lines said that but Aye. Gary Hooper is one of those guys that fits that bill exactly because yeah. as you said Muff, he made the, the move arguably wrong place wrong time um, I mean I must say he's clocked a lot of your miles Gary Hooper and he's <laughs> I mean that's what I, sh- I think it was actually New Zealand he was at Wellington yeah. no, it was a- played in a league Played in India, Cy- uh, has he played in Cyprus? Yet? Aye, I mean, aye, aye, aye. I, I don't know if he, he was playing, but I, I knew he was. He played and left. Has he played and left? Once uh, and left, I think he was only two or three weeks after. Because I, I knew he was about. I, I don't think he, let's just say he wasn't match fat when yeah. Lennon signed him. Um, but yeah, I, I loved him. I thought he was a one of those guys that came in straight away, made an impact. He, I think he really let it down at all. Um, done it in the big games against Rangers. Done it in Europe. I mean, there's not a lot. You can argue against the guy. Done really well. Um, I think he would have loved to have come back in some capacity, but um, oh, I think ship sailed from now definitely. <laughs> but um, yeah, loved him. Loved him. One of my like a lot of the guys that we've spoke about Hooper over the years and just how God you do miss him. I, I'm with you. I, I loved Gary Hooper playing for us, and the, the the link up play between him and Anthony Stokes was frightening at points, especially against Aberdeen. He seemed to switch it on pretty well against them. Um, a lot of people talk about the goals, uh, the goal against Spartak at home, the one that's seen us throughout the last 16. Incredible finish, took it on so well and just... I uh, don't think that gets actually really acknowledged enough, that goal. I yeah. always remember watching it, it was an absolute screamer. It's a great goal. I get, we were brilliant that night, we were, we were so good that night. But my favourite goal actually came in a defeat at Ibrox, uh, the 4-2 game, and he just passes it, he just uses the I grain of the grass. And it. Oh. Oh. They bends it round McGregor. I've never seen. You actually see for the angle behind him, it goes out to the right as if it's going to go wide and just bends in. No, it's an incredible finish. I think the celebration. I don't know if you ever noticed that. I've I've not really watched that school back a lot, <laughs> given that we lost. But I've seen it a few times. But I, I don't know if you notice the celebration. Scott Brown tries to jump on top of him. Aye. It does last. Like, all over him. Aye. 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 Disappears from the tap. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, quiz for you here. Who scored the first goal of that game? El Kaduri. Well done. I was in his debut. Game. Well done. That's not this mystery cell, by the I way. Was, I was at that game. Aye. Aye. That's why we could beat. <laughs> I, I've, 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 I've got a bad record at Ibrox, oh, so right. I don't go anywhere. We'll, we'll not, I will not talk anyway, about that. Anyway, You're not allowed to. <laughs> um, okay, guys. So this week's mystery cell, then. Let me just bring up this information here. So, yeah, as we've said, Gary Hooper, an absolute hero to us. Um, again, for this week's mystery cell. The first 10 people who reply with the right answer to this week's Mystery Cell on Twitter will be gifted a month completely free of the Celtic Exchange Plus. If you need to, sorry, if you head to our Twitter page right now, you'll see the clues posted there as our pinned tweet and good luck to everyone taking part. Lads, are we all ready? Aye, we're ready. Nice okay. one. No problem at all. So, clue number one. I was an unused sub in Seville. I was an unused sub in Seville. Clue number two. I played in Scotland, Netherlands, and the USA. <laughs> and oh. Clue number three. I'm now the academy coach at Nashville FC. So I'm now the academy coach at Nashville FC. Oh. Oh. I'm just letting Miff go through oh, the motions here. I'm You've actually sure. got it. Have I? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Get Danny Ed now. Aye, we'll need to, we'll need to, but I've, I've got... <laughs> well done, well done. Get up, you Tino! <laughs> Get up, you Tino! Brilliant. Oh, oh, he's so not even fair. here at all. Oh, his Aye. face will be a picture. I know. <laughs> yeah! Suddenly that pint and pizza doesn't taste Woo! good anymore, mate. Well, I thought that was going to be a difficult one, but there you go. Um... Anyway, for the listeners, good luck with that one. I'm pretty sure you'll get it if Miff got it. Oh, aye, aye. Very <laughs> good. 
I mean, I was going to say it again, but I think I was too young for that one. Oh. So <laughs> I thought I'll just leave him to it. Fair play, fair play. <laughs> okay, so let's now have a look at the listener's question, which this week comes from Jamie in Perth, Australia. Hi team, big fan all the way from Perth, Australia. Question for consideration. Like every Celtic fan, I don't want to think about this, but it's inevitable that Ange will move on. When he does, I think he'll be heavily involved in appointing his his successor. Do you think having two or maybe three years working under Ange means that big John Kennedy will now be ready to take the job on permanently come that time? In my opinion, he is the man to take over. I'm a huge fan and I think Ange is too. For all the great work you do in the show, it's great for us that have left the city to still hear some great Celtic chat. Cheers, guys. He's a hugely experienced coach in terms of his time at Celtic, but will he be perfectly placed to have worked so closely with Ange as his number two to move into that manager role? What's your initial thoughts on that? Um, I, 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 it would be a no from me. Uh, ju- just, I think that what the appointment of Ange has shown, in, in my opinion anyway, is that there are clearly a whole host of, of talented coaches there much like we would recruit a, a player I think you also need to recruit a coach like that somebody who has a wee bit of something to prove or who's grateful of, of the chance and I know John Kennedy would be that you know and I know he's a huge Celtic man that is not not in doubt you know comes from a, a you know a Celtic supporting or well partly a Celtic supporting uh, family in Cleland his Celtic credentials are not in doubt was cruelly denied what would have been a stellar career yeah. by circumstances so uh, you know that were out of his control a horror tackle um, so I've no doubt he's, he's really driven he appears to be a really driven guy measured guy talks really well you even see him in the sidelines as well he's not taking any nonsense um, I think what well, didn't really get picked up with the press at the weekend Lee Johnson did a wee barge at him and then um, Hibs were messing about with the, putting the ball back into play and holding on to the ball and things like that. Big Kennedy went over and took matters into his own hands. And Johnson kind of left the shoulder in when he was walking by, but safe to say, he just kind of spin round after he hit Big Kennedy. Um, so he's, he's got that bit about him. For me, though, eh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great believer in that, that being, being the number two, if you look at that th- through, through time, very few step up and, and do well by just graduating as, as the number two into, into the head coach. I think you need someone else to come in fresh and implement their own ideas, just like Ange did when he came in. I, I think I think that's 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 what you need. Um that's not to say I, I don't I don't rate Kennedy. I think he's an excellent coach. But I my preference would be for him to go elsewhere and gain that experience as as the man, as the head coach or the manager before then coming back if, if he proves to be good enough if he goes elsewhere I think it's a difficult one though because any time any clubs have come sniffing around him um, and he's, he's I think he's very highly thought of John Kennedy across the game um, any time he's been mentioned or linked with other teams I've always kind of thought no we keep him here we keep him here we keep him close because personally I think the experience that he's banked up since working under Dyla is and, and, and working under Lennon working under Rogers and I just think with this guy, it's coming all full circle. Everything that he's kind of picked up on. You remember the old cliche that he was the the defence coach. I <laughs> get you get hot with that, didn't you? Oh, I know. Aye, but just I think he knows this club inside out. That's that's a given. But what I definitely think is he's picking up more and more each day. My question is: is that is is it too big for him? Is the job too big for him? Does he need that experience? But then, will we let him go for that experience? What do you think, Joe? I mean, I think one thing that definitely needs to be addressed at a bigger club is that the coach, the the gap between being an assistant coach and a manager is absolutely massive. And, okay, he st- I mean, the only time we can really compare him as a manager was probably the worst time. I mean, he came in at the worst time possible. <laughs> he didn't have a transfer window. He actually picked players. He, he had that very very limited squad to pick from who are very low in confidence very low in form so on that basis there's not a lot to go by um i don't know because 
I think this would be the best opportunity for him, given that I mean, given what Andrew's done in a, such a short space of time. Hopefully, we've got Ange for the long haul. I would love to say that, but we've seen it happen before. It wouldn't be the worst. I mean, it wouldn't be the worst time for him to follow suit. But I think I remember when Lennon came in after Rogers. The idea when Neil Lennon came in was that we're going to replicate Rogers' style and we're going to replicate his ideas. But ultimately, John Kennedy's his own man, and he's going to. You can't bring in, I don't think personally you can bring in a, ma- a manager or a coach to step up and expect him just to think the exact same way the guy thinks before him. Um, also, the fact that, I mean, we had this discussion a few weeks ago when I was on here, that we had a discussion a few weeks ago about like, youth development and you know Celtic haven't really produced a striker. And the reason I don't think we have in the youth development is because we can't really afford to give people that a chance. Mm-hmm. I think this is what's the same way with John Kennedy, that it's it's too big a job for his first time round. You need to be ready to step up and you need to have more than just a coaching experience in the bank. Sean Maloney it was one of the best highly rated coaches in the game. I mean, worked under Roberto Martinez. His first job at Hibs, albeit it was unlucky to go, but didn't say the header light at Hibs at all. Um, so it shows you a lot of things need to go your way in your first job. A lot of things, I mean, it, it's a very, very big first job to take. Um, do I think he could be a good manager in the future? I mean, he's only, what, how old is John Kennedy? What, he's not even 40, is he? 41, 40, 40, 40, 42. 40, so, not old at all. Not old at all. Not old at all. So you've got another 25 years in the game, realistically, at the, at the very least. So <laughs> there's not there's still time for him. I just don't think he is his first Joe's got me talking about retirement age now. <laughs> <laughs> what a kick in this is, man. Ah, um, laid into him after no, no, I, I know. Tino, I know. Tino has paid you. <laughs> um, the, I, don't, I don't think, I don't want this to seem like it's a slight on Kennedy because no. it's not. I, I, think, I think Joe makes a good point. It's about the enormity of the job and I think there are very few, that, I'm, I'm on record saying this over numerous podcasts that we've done, there are very few people who could have been come in and picked this club up the way that Ange did. It's only because Ange had the experience that he had, the worldly experience that he had. You know, had managed international level, had managed in different countries as well as his own country. It's that experience you need to call on. I think of those first that first six weeks mm-hmm. that Ange mm-hmm. endured that was torrid yeah. Yeah. whilst trying to put a team together as well. Now I'm not saying that, that there's nobody will ever take over from those circumstances again. That was just an absolute, you know, perfect storm okay. of nonsense that, that Ange had to inherit but even at that you you will come under a great deal of pressure as, as a Celtic manager and, and maybe just not having that experience of being in that position before like Ange has been numerous times um, you know you probably need someone who's walked the walk before mm-hmm. and and that would lead to like you say you, you do want John Kennedy to stay because you know how integral it is to what goes on behind the scenes but naturally, if he does want to progress, he's probably going to need to spread his wings, go elsewhere and gain that experience first. I, yeah, I, I think it's a very difficult one. I do. Obviously, we, before we, we, we continue on that with John Kennedy, what do we think the realistic time scales for Andrew remaining at Celtic are? I, mean, I don't you, even want to think about it. I, I know, I know. Listen, <laughs> I, I have to ask these questions, guys, if the listeners don't want to hear it as well but also we need to think about this well he's, he, he's on record the saying that I think you'll be surprised by, by how long I stay so so do you think he could be here to build a long term legacy is that just as a Celtic manager do you think he maybe looks at other departments Um, I, yeah I, th- I think I think he, you know I think he'll I, I think coaching's his passion so I don't I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily see him you know yearning for a a move up, up upstairs. Right. Um, that's just my, my opinion. I, I think coaching's his passion. I think deep down he'll want a crack at England. I Aye. think. I, I think, think about that down, as well. I think deep down he'll want a crack at England. However, I, I again think that he will be put off by the kind of musical chairs approach to management down there. I think he will really, really need a club that woo him and, and make him believe that he's going to be given a couple of years to do what, what he has to do. Who that club will be. I don't right. know. That's what I was going to ask. Who, um, who, is who it? that club will be, I don't know. It will need to be a club that, that, that do it right. So I think in, in the absence of that, we, we might still have him for a, another couple of years. And, and if it is, I'm just going to enjoy every minute of it. I, I hate I hate what we've become in many ways because whether it's players or managers, we've become, we have become that stepping stone, whether we like to admit it or not, it's a different thing. Immediately, we're, we're, a, 
a tribute and a value after watching a player play a couple of games and thinking, oh, he'll go for a lot of money. Listen, I do it myself. It's it's just it's just horrible that you're you're almost kind of planning the exit for players and, and a manager before you, oh he's going to go for big money or oh he'll, he'll go and manage down south. I, ju- I just think really the, the time is now just to enjoy what we've got because the the guy that we've got in charge is just the man. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's it's definitely going to vary, isn't it? I think um, when we look at when we look at players and managers that definitely go down into into England, you know. It's a risk for them, hundred percent a risk for them. But it, yeah, I get it's a bit of a tick box exercise. My thinking here is possibly, you know, football looks as if inevitably stuff's going to change in the next few years as well. I don't think UEFA have the same power as what they once not. did. I'm not, I'm not against it, but I'm not entirely for it as well. I, I, I like, I like my setup. I like my routine, Joe. Yeah, I, I'm I like, the same. I like my league. I like my Champions League. Yeah. Even the Conference League, I was still scratching my head to, as to how teams weren't playing in the Europa League there and like different, like the different like format that that's brought up. I get that it's going to make different competitions a little bit more exciting and and stronger field of teams. Um, you even have to look at Barcelona, Man United, and the Europa League there. Um. But the chat is is that the Super League kind of chat isn't going away, and I've got a strong feeling. I don't know why. I, I just think we we're involved in the talks. I I, I generally I seen, I seen something related to that. But even like you're talking about the way football's changing. I mean, even I think next season is the last season Champions League in the format that it is. Yeah. The eight groups of four. It's going to like some sort of Swiss League format. So yeah. we're playing. I think we've got eight Champions League games if we qualify. Um, so it's just it's mental in that sense, but. Uh, like you're saying with Ange, I mean, I'm, I love him to stay and I think what he's doing is brilliant. He's, cl- he's stayed at his clubs for a relatively long time. I mean, it clearly looks, I mean, he's building something really special. But the problem is, like with every manager, that it comes a point that they will want to leave and I think he does want to have a crack in England. It's just a matter of who's, I was going to say patient, he's got a pedigree, but it's the type of job he's done. He's a, I, I always think he's a builder That's, he builds for the bottom and Aye. he's done it before so it's whoever is willing to give him that opportunity to stay as long it's I mean he's, he's not going to go to Watford does he that's no, one thing no, absolutely. No, absolutely again as well he'll be dealing when you think that, that he's been in Australia where, where he's revered he's then went to Japan where the culture's you know different it's, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily um money driven as, as as such certainly for the domestic players um, are the values that they would go for but wouldn't it be extreme as they are in England and even coming to Scotland there's still a bit more soul in Scottish football than there is in English football yep. when you go to England you're dealing with a different kind of level of ego and, and mentality around what motivates the players it's, it's mainly moving for, for the money you know and, and expectations they're, as well they're already different. they're already wealthy individuals you know you're, you, are you really going to be able to go there and develop them the way that he has developed some players here that 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 would be the key question, but ultimately, I think he will want a crack at that because he's he's earned it. Um, but for me, I think we've still got another couple of years of him left. I'm I'm very hopeful on that. Good one. No, me too. Me too. I have to ask then, John Kennedy to replace Ange. Would it be yes or no? It's a no for me. No. Okay. It's a no for me. I love Kennedy, but yeah, I think I know for me as well. A really good question for me there, Jamie. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jamie. Yep. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and obviously, yeah, um, if you want to submit your question to us for discussion on any future shows, then you can do so in one of the three ways. Uh, you can leave a voicemail directly on our website via the microphone icon at the bottom right of any page of the site. You can send us a message on social media at our Twitter, Instagram or Facebook page. Or you can email Tino directly at, at it's, uh, tino at the Celtic Exchange.com. Okay, guys. We're moving on to this week in Celtics Media. Uh, Each week here in the weekly show, we pick out something that we think you'd enjoy from the world of Celtic Media. This week, Miff has a good one for us. Miff, what do you have, mate? Well, um, as appropriate as it might be, a wee walk down memory lane, seeing as Joe said a couple of digs at my age (laughs) tonight. Um, And it's uh, harking back to the the run to Seville 2003. It's the, the anniversary of the victory at Anfield. And again, just brings back some... Amazing memories. Sad, sadly, wasn't able to get a ticket to go. Although, if you look at the away end, it was majorly oversubscribed. Yep. Um, when you look at the celebrations, when when John Hartson's goal goes in, but uh, you know Alan Thompson scoring at a cop, and then a, a 
I mean, Hartson's goal, that, that's probably one of the, the great goals in Celtics, certainly in Celtics' recent history. Um, it just evokes such strong memories of a, of a team which was an amazing team to follow, certainly not to make it about me, but at that time in my life, you know, they were they were just a, a brilliant team. And and for what had went before, you know, that was the, the establishment of, of O'Neill's dominance, albeit in that season. I know we, we didn't we didn't win anything, but but that season was so much fun. Yeah. Just great, great to watch. And 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 the lesser spotted um Momo Silla start starting that game. Uh, outstanding. You know, as he well. was he was he was absolutely brilliant. I just I just go, I think it's only two, two and a half, but we're going to put it out. I think it's only two and a half, three minutes long. Mm-hmm. Just go, make yourself a wee cuppa, <laughs> sit back, watch it, and just drink it all in. Ah. Absolutely magic. It's excellent. I think it was one of those moments, I, I, I think a lot of Celtic fans after that game were like, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to go all the way here. Um, and yeah, just, just the, the, the way, the manner in which we played, we thought one each at Celtic Park, I think, it was it was put a lot of doubt into everyone's minds, and then just to go down to Anfield and well, just play the way we played. I was in um, I was in my mate's flat in Fordwood, my mate Gizzy, listening to the show. I guess, <laughs> um, and he, like but I think there was a bit yeah, like just the usual sort of stuff, you know, midweek cargo and you go, but real nervousness just because again it's that I think. Scotland, there's that almost natural inferiority complex when it comes to play. Oh, we're playing an English team, a big English, a big bad English team. Yeah. But, but that that there was the one thing about Anil's team is they just didn't fear anyone. anyone. As was as was shown in, mm. in their record, they yeah. they were up for the battle and the characters in that team. Arrogance and then and then what we had, team. what we probably didn't. Well, we did realise it, but we didn't realise it at the same time. It was just we had Henrik Larsson. Yeah. We had one of the preeminent strikers in in Europe. Uh, we were just so lucky to have him. And, he was he was always a threat every time he was on the park. Just what a what a team. You could what do a team. It. I, obviously Larson's a standout, right? I, I would never disagree with that. But then you could do that with a lot of the players in the team. Oh. I always just think oh. back. We had Paul Lambert, a European Aye. Cup winner. What a we, yep. we we had Chris Sutton, who was like an inc- incredible the Blackburn seasons, absolutely. But then obviously lost his way at Chelsea. That that these things happen in football, but just. Sutton, I, I think as a centre half, you would never want to come up against a player like him. It's the he just, I just, it's <laughs> the arrogance. It's Hartson had it as well. Just that well, arrogance well, of I'm better than you. Well, the mm. fact, the fact that we were able to take those three strikers, those three strikers who, who all three of them would have played for any team in England. Aye, yeah, bar, bar maybe one or two at that time. Um, I think Sutton missed that Anfield game. I think he was injured that he game. Did. I think he broke his wrist. Aye, aye. Um, <clears throat> so in many ways, a happy accident because Hartson was on the part to score the goal, but. Um, what a, what a team, even even with Big Baldy at the back, Aye. you know, um, just a, a, a phenomenal, phenomenal team. Um, Douglas, Douglas that night as well, by the way. Douglas pulled off some incredible saves. I remember the desperation creeping him into wee Stevie G and uh, him trying to shoot for 50 yards, 40 yards, whatever. And Douglas was pulling off some incredible saves. I know a lot of people speak about the final and stuff like that, but he definitely played his part in the run-up right. as well, 100%. Mm. No, good memories. Um as always with this one, we'll, we'll post a link for that onto uh, the show notes for this episode. So we'll put that on the website and on the social media uh, sites as well. But great memories, great memories. I might actually watch The Road to Seville tonight. <laughs> just not the final. Nah, just not the final. I'll always turn it off then. So Joe, it's been good having you back on the show today. Uh, what's your final thoughts on Celtic just now as we head into the international break? Um, oh, happy with everything, the way it's going. Uh I hope, as we've discussed, I hope Andrew's here for the long haul. I hope this is just the very, very early stage of his Celtic career. But um, yeah, I think an international breaks come at a relatively good time, if you're thinking injury-wise. Um, but yeah, absolutely delighted with everything, how it's going. Good result on Saturday and business end of the season. Here we come. Hopefully it's a, hopefully it's a treble. Hopefully. Hopefully. Nice one. Miff, a couple of weeks for Celtic to the set ahead of, of the running. Your final thoughts for the week is pre- prepare for a big end to the season. Well, it's always great to get into these breaks with a victory and a victory that looked potentially in jeopardy for, for long periods um, in the game on Saturday. So I think we've built up a, a fierce bit of momentum. As Joe says, business end of the season, hopefully minimal injuries for any players that are away uh, at, the, at the international break. And then we come back. Is it Dingwall? Dingwall, we come back yep. and go yep. to. So you know, always, always a difficult fixture. So yeah, just ho- hopefully 
unscathed for the international break and then back at it with three points at Dingle. Nice one. Well, guys, that wraps things up on this latest episode of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. A thanks to Miff and Joe for joining me today. And as always, a thanks to you guys for listening. Remember to send your mystery cell answer to us on Twitter for your chance to win a free month of the Celtic Exchange Plus. And beyond that, don't forget to visit theceltichange.com forward slash sign up where you can start your free seven day trial. In the meantime, a big thank you from myself and the team. This episode today is for Isabel Vernal. And here's our favourite song. Show and the Glasgow Celtic will be there.